stepping into the breach to cover two of his colleagues who were unable to attend. So if we could have a stand innovation, please, for Shane Kumpf, our first speaker of the afternoon. Thank you. All right, hello, everyone. Uh, quick mic check, can you hear me all right? Excellent. All right, my name's Shane Kumpf. I'm a principal engineer with Cloudera. I was supposed to be joined by my colleague, Sunil. Unfortunately, he had a family emergency and, and had to back out at the last minute. Um, so what I'm here to talk to you about today is our journey towards KubeBird. Um, for those that don't know, I want to talk a little about, a bit about who Cloudera is. So Cloudera, we're the creators of the big data industry and ecosystem uh, powered by open source software. Um, our open data lakehouse product, CDP, enables portable cloud native data analytics, uh, helping organizations manage any type of data on any cloud, whether it's public or private. Um, and what we found is that shipping an open data lakehouse is challenging, right? Um, Cloudera's open data lakehouse is built on 30 different open source offerings. Uh, we do dozens of product releases every year. We support running CDP on nearly a dozen different Linux operating systems. We integrate with multiple databases, security products, hardware appliances, et cetera. Uh, and the result of all this is that we run hundreds of thousands of tests across tens of thousands of ephemeral clusters for every single release that we do. And so how we've met that demand to date is on a container cloud powered by Apache Hadoop Yarn. So myself, Sunil, and others, we're all Hadoop committers. We have a long history with Hadoop. Uh, we built capabilities to run Docker containers on top of Yarn. Uh, this provides a, an ephemeral VM-like container for product testing and development. Um, it's fronted by a very simple API. You, the users specify resources like memory and CPU, uh, the number of instances they want, and then what Docker, Docker image to run. We then orchestrate that across a collection of bare metal systems. And what's really important about these containers is each of these containers gets a stable IP and host name. They have SSH running, and they have things like systemd running in the container. So for our users, this feels very much like a VM. They can SSH into it. They can install their software how they typically do. Right? It feels like a Linux VM to them. And as a result of that, we've seen really high adoption over the past six years. Our, clusters now, our production cluster is now 700 plus nodes. Uh, we have dozens of teams in queues where we split up the resources in these clusters. And at any given time, we have upwards of 1,500 clusters across 8,000 containers. And we're seeing an average memory utilization of about 80% on this cluster. However, after running the system for the past six years, you know, a number of pain points have emerged. Containers are great, but we do have some VM use cases that don't fit into containers. Uh, for some of our certification purposes, we have to run custom kernels. Uh, we like to do Docker right, uh, in containers. Doing Docker and Docker at scale is a hard problem. Um, and we have specific security requirements, things like FIPS, where we need custom parameters inside of these instances. Um, we've also found that host maintenance is, is quite difficult. Uh, our existing cluster is, is ephemeral in nature. These containers are ephemeral. If a host fails, a container fails, the state is lost, right? Um, so that makes it very difficult to do host maintenance when you have to coordinate with all of the people that are running software on that system. Uh, additionally, if peop for people that don't know about Hadoop, um, when you run an application on Yarn, there's a small application that gets deployed along with it that manages the life cycle. Um, at scale, that becomes a problem. That small overhead for every application is equaling 10 to 5 to 10 terabytes of memory on our cluster today. And then finally, you know, Docker on Yarn is a feature that's not in active development. Um, it's something we built years ago. Um, so we wanted to look at other al alternatives there as well. So we stepped back and started to reassess our options for this platform. Uh, but to do that, we really need to think about what are our requirements. So first and foremost, we need a performant, scalable deployment of compute resources. Um, we still want to support containers. Right? We, we went towards containers in the beginning because of all their benefits. We still want to support those for those original reasons. Uh, we need flexibility on which operating system, you know, kernel, security config happens per deployment. And we want very simple network connectivity. We don't want to have to deal with all the pod networking, all the proxies, et cetera. We want direct connections to these through stable host names and routable IPs. And then finally, improving host maintenance will improve user satisfaction um, if we can make it easier on our users so that they don't need to uh, shut down their applications. So things like live migration and persistent storage become very important to us. And so we started to explore what's out there today. Right? Uh, first, we looked at VM orchestrators, things like OpenStack, rolling our own with, with libvirt, et cetera. But the main challenge there is there's no support for containers. So we'd still have to bring some container orchestrator there. 
Uh, we then looked at uh, newer versions of H H Apache Hadoop Yarn. Um, again, there, there's no support for VMs, so we have some, many of the same gaps we have today. Uh, we spent some time looking at Har Harvester, and it's actually really interesting, but it's more of a focus on VMs, and the thing that really scared us away from it is the entire stack is shipped as a bootable ISO. Uh, so we were a little concerned about the vendor lock-in that would, that would cause. And so then we came across a solution called KubeVert HCO. So HCO is the hyper-converged cluster operator. This is an operator you could run on your Kubernetes cluster that bundles multiple different operators, things like KubeVert, the disk imaging that you need to get the VM images out there, advanced networking, DNS, a VM proxy, and more. And what was really appealing here is that it supports both VMs and containers. So it was a good fit for what we were looking at. So once we decided that KubeVert was an interesting solution that we, could, we should spend more time on, we wanted to see how we could fit that into our overall architecture. So I'm going to spend a minute just talking about where we've landed. I'm not going to go into everything here. It's a bit of an ice chart. Um, but I at least wanted to call out the main components that make up our new stack. So at its core, we're running a Kubernetes cluster based on RKE2, which is Rancher's, uh, Rancher's RKE2. On that cluster, we've deployed the HCO, that operator, to, to manage the VMs. Underneath the hood, we use Longhorn for our storage for persistent volumes. And where we've done things a little bit different is we've adopted Apache Unicorn. Uh, Apache Unicorn is an advanced Kubernetes scheduler that does a lot of things that the default scheduler doesn't do. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, we've developed a system internally inside of Cloudera called Umbra. Umbra provides us a quota management system on top of Kubernetes. How do you split up a Kubernetes cluster's resources amongst groups, teams, et cetera? Uh, unfortunately, the out-of-the-box DNS implementation that comes with KubeVert didn't meet our needs. As I said before, we wanted both pods and, and VMs to have that persistent DNS. Uh, what comes out of the box doesn't meet that need, so we built our own. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then we use things like Prometheus for metrics, StackStorm, and AWX for our event and workflow system, and we built a custom API server that mimics that existing system we're coming from. We want that same simple API for people to get into this, this cluster as well. So once we looked at this and overlaid it into our architecture, it looked like it was a great fit. Uh, so we started to move forward with implementation. Um, and we hit a number of challenges. And that's really where I want to spend the rest of the time during this talk, is talk about some of the challenges we hit and how we address those challenges. Um, so we hit. As I said, we, we really want that stable IP address. That's different than Kubernetes. In Kubernetes, when a pod goes away, you don't know what IP address you're going to get. It makes it very difficult for existing systems that expect to run in a VM and bind to that address and, and keep that address for the, life of its, for the life of the application. Similarly, on the DNS side, we need the stable name resolution for pods. There is something that comes with KubeVert called Kube Secondary DNS. Um, unfortunately, that only handles the VM side. As we started to provision things, we noticed that provisioning was extremely slow. Um, we're used to, if an image is localized, a couple of seconds to bring up a container, right? Um, as we move to KubeVert, what you need to do is that OS image needs to be copied into a PV for every single VM that you run. That copy process was way too long for us. It just simply wouldn't work. Uh, live migration was extremely important to us, but it doesn't look like it works out of the box. What, what do we need to do to make it work? And then finally, multi-tenancy. We have to have the ability to do queues, capacity guarantees, split up this cluster amongst all the different groups. So how did we address each of these? So the first one I want to talk about is the network architecture. Um, so again, the gap that we had is we wanted to bind to a stable, routable IP address for both pods and VMs for external connectivity. And the way we address that is through three different pieces of technology. There's something called the NM state operator, Multis CNI and the Whereabouts CNI plugin. So the NM state operator was the first piece. What that allows us to do is manage the network, the network interfaces on the kubelet hosts. If you're familiar with Network Manager, this is built on top of that. It allows you to then uh, create additional interfaces on each of the kubelets. And it's all done through an operator. So somebody doesn't have to go into configuration management when they provision these machines. Uh, you can do it all through Kubernetes. The next is Multis CNI. So CNI is the container networking interface. Multis allows you to run multiple different CNIs um, uh, under a single CNI plugin. And so by doing that, we were, allowed to, we were able to then create the network interfaces and bind them to the bridge. And then finally, because we're using routable IPs, we're not using the pod network, we needed to give some IPs, some routable IPs, uh, that could be used to give out to these pods. And that's where whereabouts CNI comes in. 
You give it a pool of IP addresses, and it will hand them out to pods and make sure there's no, uh, no conflicts, no IP conflicts. And so with these in place, we now have a stable IP that moves between containers and VMs. On the, network, on the DNS architecture side, um, again, we were missing that stable uh, name resolution for pods as that cube secondary DNS only supports VMs. So what we've done is we've actually forked cube secondary DNS to add pod support. And the way that this works is that the zone file for core DNS is stored on shared storage. There's a sidecar within core DNS that looks for these virtual machine and uh, pod creation. When it sees one of those, it creates a, a entry in the shared zone file. And then due to a setting within core DNS, auto reload being turned on, it will automatically, core DNS will automatically read any changes to shared storage and make those DNS records available. So from that, we have stable DNS names across both of those systems. Uh, the next issue we hit was around the VM provisioning times. Um, and, and really, that was about this use of something called a data volume. Data volume is what Kubert provides to copy that VM image into a PV so that you can boot that VM. Um, because we use Longhorn, there's already an existing capability in Longhorn called backing images. And they, connect, they actually support QCOW2 images, so copy on write type of images. So we can take existing QCOW2 images, create them as, backing device, as a backing image inside of Longhorn, and then use that as our PV, oops, me, use that as our PV for the VM. So what this means is we don't have to do this copy operation. We use this, this copy on write image that as long as it's already localized, will be mounted and starts up extremely quick. Um, so we create a storage class for each operating system we support. So if it's CentOS 7 and, Cent and Ubuntu 20, we have to have two different storage classes for that. And then when a VM comes up, it specifies the storage class for the operating system it needs. Um, and then that, that will become a PV that is its persistent root volume. And this provisioning only takes a couple of seconds due to the copy on write nature. Uh, the next feature was live migration. So what is really needed to get live migration working for VMs? Um, and what we found is there's, there's something called the live migrate eviction strategy, uh, as well as the, the need to use persistent root disks. So if you leverage that live migrate eviction strategy that HCO gives you, when you drain a node, it'll automatically live migrate that VM to another system. Um, you get this for free uh, with, with the out-of-the-box common VM templates. If you're doing your own custom templates, you have to include this. Uh, additionally, you need a read-write mini persistent volume because there's a copy operation that happens for this migration, to, for this live migrate to happen. Um, there's also some work we're looking at in the future it, with, because there is a copy operation. That means data is moving. And if data is moving, that's moving across your network, right? So there's the ability to set up a data-only network behind the scenes for migration activities. This is very similar to how you know, the VM orchestrators like ESX do it. And then finally, I want to talk a little bit about our quota management efforts. So how can we split up resources between different teams within this cluster, right? So Kubernetes exposes all of the CPU and memory. How can we split that up so the teams have guarantees that they have capacity when they come to use it? Um, and our solution there is to implement a hierarchical resource quota system, right? And we're doing that using Cloudera's Umbra and Apache Unicorn. So I, I mentioned that Umbra is something we've built in-house. Uh, it is a core component of our CDP offering, and it provides an API for, for defining a hierarchy of resources. You define a root with some amount of resources and then split that up into children, and then ultimately a namespace is tied to a leaf queue. And when you deploy to that leaf queue, we're going to use resources within that to, to make sure that you've got the capacity. Um, Apache Unicorn is an advanced Kubernetes scheduler so this is something that's getting a lot of traction right now. So it does a lot of things that the existing default scheduler inside of Kubernetes cannot do. Um, so it gives you quota enforcement. It can do things like preemption. Um, it has priority. It has the ability to do gang scheduling. Gang scheduling is extremely important for big data applications. Um, think about a Spark application where you have a driver and some number of executors running. If your driver is the only thing that gets scheduled, you never do any work, right? So you need to be able to schedule the driver and the executor together as a gang to make sure that you can actually do some work on a cluster. Uh, you know, Kubernetes has none of that built in today. 
And so Umbra integrates directly with Unicorn to do all of the quota enforcement. So as we create this hierarchy of, of resources, we also tell Unicorn about those queues and it does the enforcement behind the scenes for us. And again, it is doing it at the scheduler level. All right, so having talked a little bit about the challenges we've had, um, I want to do a demo that shows Cube, KubeVert in action uh, with some of the capabilities we've talked about here today. Is that visible? Can you Let's see how this looks? Are you able to see? Yeah, all right. So the first thing we're going to do should look pretty familiar to anybody that's worked with Kubernetes for a while. Uh, we're going to deploy a pod using a pod YAML template. A uh, very basic pod in this case. And then we're also going to deploy a VM. And this shows you how easy it is. You know, uh, with kubevert, you have a couple of custom resources, one being the virtual machine resource. So all we've done is define this virtual machine resource, uh, this custom resource, and behind the scenes, the HCO and libvirt will then take this and create the VM for us. Here we can see that the pod is up and running in this cluster. It took about 12 seconds to get started. The VMs take a little bit longer, but with the improvements we've made, uh, it's still a very reasonable amount of time to get up and running. So here we can see we're up and running. Um, the demo VM has been running for 25 seconds. And note the IP. This is an IP that's not inside of the pod network. This is a separate IP that we've provided. This 10.17 range is the one we've given to whereabouts. Uh, you can also see that this particular VM is running on worker one within this Kubernetes cluster. So now that we've got those two resources deployed, we want to look a little bit more into the network inside. So first things first, we're going to look at the pod. So here, Looking at a pod, we can see we've attached an additional network interface to it using Multis CNI and the work we've done on the networking side. And note the IP address. This is also part of that, that uh, range that we've provided to whereabouts. So it's a 10.17.168.100 address. But you'll also notice that we've, we've got the pod IP in there as well. So we're not throwing away the pod network, right? Everything's still accessible on the pod network. We're giving it another stable identifier that users from ex external to the cluster can use. And if we dump the same thing for the VM, we will see that that VM also has an IP on that same network that we've added through Multis. So now that we've got the IPs persistent, how do we manage the DNS side? And here we'll show that both of these get a name, or both of these get a persistent DNS entry inside of our cloudera.com domain with that, that whereabouts IP. So they, these are accessible from external. These names will not change. It gives the user a stable identifier to access. And so here's a little bit about the whereabouts config and how we're doing the attachment to the bridge. It's something called a network attachment definition. Um, you'll see more, more about that as you dive into trying to do this. And then finally, we want to do an example of live, mi live migration. So here's that VM we stood up before. A couple of things I want to note. Uh, see how long it's been running? Eight minutes and seven seconds. You can see the IP ends in 101, and it's running on worker one. So at this point, we have initiated a, a forced migration. So this isn't the result of draining a node. We've asked this specific my VM to migrate. And here we watch the status. And then it's finally succeeded. And now we want to look inside of that, that VM to make sure that the live migration happens successfully. So here we can see we're now running on worker two. The IP has not changed. The age has not changed. Here we're SSHing directly into the container. 
and doing an uptime, and you can see that this container's been running for eight minutes. So despite the fact that this was moved oops, between systems, uh, the IP remains the same, the processes are still have eight minutes of uptime, and everything has been successfully live migrated. And with that, huge thank you to the open source community. You know, clearly we can't do it without you. We, we really appreciate all the hard work there, and I'd like to open it up for questions. Thank you, Shane. Awesome. Thank you. Round of applause, please. Okay. Right, questions. Any questions? Yes. We good? Testing? Yeah. Uh, just wondering, so you've got a fork of the secondary DNS um, operator. Did you look at the secondary, uh, sorry, the um, external DNS operator? So, yeah, that is an option as well, and we've, we've talked about that. The, the thing with external DNS is you have to talk to something external, right? This still kept it all internal for us without needing to have that external dependency. Okay, yep. Yep. fair enough. But we, in Yarn, we actually run our own DNS server. So we, we wrote our own DNS server that manages it all at scale. Uh, so technically, yes, we could hook into something like that for our external DNS. Gotcha. Thanks. Okay. Any more questions? Yes. Thanks for the talk. Uh, on the topic of improving VM provisioning times, could you unpack a little bit how that persistent volume, how is that working? Are you basically using that as a golden image then for the subsequent nodes that you're putting in the cluster? That's it exactly. So. And again, we're leveraging something that Longhorn gives us, right? The ability to have the, it's something called a, that, that backing image. Um, so it's a little bit different because of we're, we're using Longhorn in that case. Um, but what happens in that case, you create a backing image and then you create a storage class out of that. Every time that a, a VM uses that storage class, a new PV that uses that underlying uh, QCOW image will be provisioned. So as long as the QCOW image is already deployed to the systems, it's extremely fast to get it up and running. And But are you then getting the same machine IDs across everything, or are you managing that in a separate way? Um, that, I mean, that's a good question. You're talking like uh, like your cloud init type stuff? Exactly. Yeah. I, I, that's a good question. I think that's all handled by, by Libvirt internally. Okay. Um, yeah, because we're not doing anything specifically for that, any sort of cloud Thank init you. type stuff. Yep. Hey, any more questions, folks? So it looks like tremendous effort have gone into this. <laughs> um, do you have any page where we all can learn, like do you have some documentation, somewhere wiki, some YouTube, somewhere where, okay, this is all the thing, all the struggles, and this is the solution, so that anybody else can, like us, can learn Absolutely. from it and see if we can implement the same thing in our company? For sure, that's a great question. Um, so this talk is kind of going on a road show right now. I expect we're gonna put out some blogs very soon that, that outline those details. So, yep, um, that should be coming to the Cloudera blogs. We don't want to reinvent this. Exactly, no, no, and we want, to, we want to share the learnings. I mean, we've been spending a bunch of time on it, so absolutely. Okay, a any more questions? So just curious on NM state, uh, any tips for uh, debugging the win wonderful joys of NM state um, as it starts to run into issues, maybe trying to configure a node uh, network? Yeah. Yeah, and, and we have had some problems like that due to, we have a bunch of different hardware, right? Um, and we, we've, we've had some challenges around that. Uh, I mean, digging into the operator logs is about the, the state we went and then getting down to the Linux systems. I mean, you know, we, we're, we're I guess comfortable managing fleets of Linux systems, so that helps. Like we, we can get down and check the OS side and whatnot. But we did hit some conflicts because ordering of, of NICs, et cetera, was a problem on, on some of our systems. So I, I don't have a, a great answer there other than you know Linux troubleshooting and look at the operator logs, right? Yeah, so, that's, yeah. That's where right. <laughs> no, it hasn't. Uh, it's powerful, but you know, with that power uh, comes some complexity for sure. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Let's have another round of applause, please, for Shane. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate it.